Gawa group of Q, the absolute Gawa group of Q, to GLN of QL bar. So there should be a natural bijection. And I should uh, explain a few things. So L is some fixed prime. And I'm going to fix, and I make things simple, an isomorphism between the complex numbers and the algebraic closure of QL. Um, and I should explain what the word algebraic means on both sides. On this side, it means that the Harris-Chandra parameter for the infinitesimal character uh, of pi infinity, how the, the character through which the center of the universal enveloping algebra acts on pi infinity, uh, which a priori is in the complexified uh, character group of a maximal torus, just as c to the n, modulo the action of the vial group, the symmetric group on n letters, in fact, is integral or maybe depending on normalizations, you have to add half the sum of the positive roots. So it's some integrality assumption on the infinitesimal character of pi infinity. On the Gawa representation side, algebraic means unramified almost everywhere, all but finitely many primes. And it means that when I restrict to the decomposition group at the prime L, if I'm looking at L-adic representations, this should be Durham in the sense of Fontaine. So of course, uh, I, I think it was uh, Bob Langlands that first proposed some sort of correspondence like this. I think it was Clozel who first said precisely what, which cuspidal automorphic representations you said should take, and maybe Fontaine and Mazer who first said exactly which L-adic representations you should take. Well, no, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, there are some partial results that I'll describe in a minute, but. Uh, there are an awful lot of cases that don't fall under those partial results. And there, I think, uh, Peter told me there's a small amount of numerical evidence in the case of mass forms on GL2. But beyond that, I, the evidence is very limited, except it makes a nice picture. No, I mean, it could be wrong. It could be wrong. Uh, so as I said, there's special cases in which we know uh, quite a lot when we pay, impose two additional assumptions, we not ask not just for uh, algebraicity, but regular algebraicity. So I have to describe that on each side. On this side, it means the infinitesimal character, uh, I want to say, doesn't, uh, doesn't lie in any of the walls. It's the same. So it's the same infinitesimal character is equal to the infinitesimal character of an algebraic representation of GLN. Or it turns out it's the same thing as saying pi infinity is cohomological, another way people sometimes say it. And on this side, it means because it's Durham, I can take the Hodge-Tate numbers of R restricted to the decomposition group at L. That's n integers, and it has to consist of n distinct integers. And the second uh, assumption you need to put on to be able to say something worthwhile uh, is what Clozel tells me I should call polarizable, though I think that's slightly confusing. Anyway, what does it mean? Uh, in this case, it means that pi is isomorphic to a twist of pi dual by a character. On this side, it means R 
factors through either the orthogonal similitude group or the symplectic similitude group inside GLN. And we have put a parity condition on the multiplier. This case must be even have an even multiplier, i.e. the multiplier takes complex conjugation to 1. And in this case, it has to have odd multiplier. And if we impose both these assumptions, a lot is known. Uh, under these assumptions, we can always go in this direction. And indeed, one can check a lot that lots of uh, properties correspond under this map. And moreover, the, uh, in most cases, the Eladic representation you get isn't just an abstract Galois representation. It comes from uh, a motif of some sort. So in fact, R is even motivic. Well, there are a few cases where we don't know R is motivic, but it's very close to being motivic. In all cases, we know it's tensor square is motivic. So and that's enough to check things like the Ramanujan conjecture uh, for pi. And <clears throat> not only that, but the motif occurs in the cohomology of Shimura variety. And equally, one can, to some degree, go back. Uh, maybe not if one has one Eladic representation, but if one has a <laughs> compatible family of such representations, one can go back. Uh, sorry, I should have said irreducible in here. One has a compatible family of such things. One can go back at least uh, after making a finite base change. So you get some sort of potential automorphic theorem. So there's a <coughs> some reasonable results in the other direction. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is what happens if one uh, tries to relax these assumptions. Now, I think much the most serious restriction is this restriction. Uh, but I'm not going to say anything about that because it's too hard for me. I'm going to talk about relaxing this uh, self-duality restriction because at least uh, I can then say something. Uh, And I should say it, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try and drop this restriction. I'm going to try and go from the automorphic representation to the Galois representation. Uh, but I think it's a theorem, though it's not written of uh, Michael Harris and maybe Laurent Clausel, that the Galois representations we want will never occur in the cohomology of any Shimura variety. They basically show that it's these represent, it's these regular algebraic polarizable things are the only things that show up in the cohomology of Shimura varieties. So <coughs> we're not going to be able to construct, when we relax these assumptions, we're not going to be able to construct the represent, our representations we want by simply uh, finding them in the cohomology of Shimura variety. You mean Shimura varieties in general? Or Shimura varieties in general, yes. So they say. <coughs> OK, so the next thing, uh, maybe I should state the theorem. And I should say this is joint work. I should say that first. This is joint work with uh, Michael Harris, Kai Wen Lan, and Jack Thorne. So the theorem I want to prove is the following. So suppose. F is a CM or totally real field. Just take Q if you like. And suppose pi is a regular algebraic cuspidal automorphic representation of GLN of AF. 
then we can associate then there exists uh, a continuous representation RL pi from GF to GLN QL bar uh, which for now just uh, just corresponds to pi at the unramified places, which is enough to fix it, uh, and a, an explicit finite set of Vlad primes. Such that uh, <coughs> for set S that we say such that for all V not in S, uh, RL pi is non-ramified at V, and the Frobenius has the part characteristic polynomial you think. Let me say that by saying RL pi restricted to the decomposition group at V, at least if we semi-simplify it. This is determined just because it's unramified by what uh, the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius is what we would expect to, by the local Langlands correspondence to associate to the local component of V. No. So, <coughs> they say we're not, we're not going to construct this Gawa representation it, we don't know that this thing is motivic. We're not going to construct it in the cohomology of any variety, so I can't, don't know anything about absolute values uh, <coughs> of. Uh, uh. Can you say some more? Yes, I do. Um, <coughs> in individual cases, as is usual when you have such a theorem, you can deduce Ramanujan. So there is an example. Just give a concrete example, uh, which was worked out by Engiemann, Hopp, and Grenier some years ago on the assumption that, you, that such a theorem was true. Well, we know it is. So on the one hand, there is a unique uh, pair of <coughs> cuspidal automorphic representations, pi and complex conjugation of pi on GL3 over the rationals uh, with conductor uh, 128. Uh, get these things right. Uh, a weight zero, so the same infinitesimal character as the trivial representation, cohomological for just the trivial representation. And uh, the field of coefficients. The field generated by the Hecker eigenvalues is Q, it's the Gaussian numbers. And on the other hand, they looked at the uh, surface X, which is the minimal model, minimal smooth model <coughs> of the two to one cover of P2. Uh, given it on with it with in an affine equations by t squared equals x y x squared minus one y squared minus one x squared minus y squared plus two x y x squared x squared minus y squared thank you <coughs> and this uh, this smooth projective surface has h one and h three zero and H4 of X is 34-dimensional, uh, 
but there's a 28 dimensional piece. Sorry? H2, I mean, thank you. <laughs> H2 is uh, 34 dimensional with a 28 dimensional piece spanned by cycles, which you can understand completely explicitly, plus a three dimensional piece. Well, if I take coefficients in not in Q, but in QI, I get, well, I get two three dimensional pieces. Or maybe let me just say it's left over with a six dimensional piece. <clears throat> and so here there's some six dimensional Galois representation. Here, by the theorem, we have RL pi and RL pi c. And what these guys prove by using the faulting Serre method that somehow allows them just to check traces are equal for a finite number of Fabinius elements that RL pi uh, plus RL pi c tensor with a quadratic character, uh, the quadratic character corresponding to Q root minus 2 over Q uh, is equal to the six-dimensional piece in here. So that then proves Ramanujan for pi. And it also then proves uh, that the L function has a holomorphic continuation to the, to the whole complex plane, except for a pole at s equals 2 and a functional equation relating s to 3 minus s. <coughs> okay, and there are more examples known uh, numerically. This is the only example where somebody, in this case Grenier, has actually checked, applied the faulting Serre method, but you could presumably produce a whole series of further examples of the same sort. He doesn't compute that many. I mean, it's less than, I think it's all P less than 100 or something. It's quite. <coughs> OK, so let me now uh, turn to the proof of the, the theorem. And the idea of the proof uh, is not new. Been known for the vague suggestion, been known for many years, I, maybe due to Chris Skinner. I'm not sure exactly. I learned it from Chris Skinner. Uh, the idea was that uh, if instead of looking at just the representation RL pi, I try to turn it into something which looks to be self-dual, in fact, conjugate self-dual, by simply adding itself to its conjugate dual. This is something that could uh, correspond to some sort, to something on, say, the unitary group UNN, where there is a Shimura variety. And although this will, this certainly won't be a, I mean, I guess it does, cor this does correspond to some Eisenstein series on this unitary group. But it, it more than that, one can hope that it corresponds to what people call an overconvergent eladic cusp form on, let's say, UNN. So Somehow, when you, when you look at eladic modular forms, you only see some of the cusps. So something that would normally, not, would normally be an Eisenstein series can behave like a cusp form in, in the eladic world. And if one has such a thing, then one could, these things live in families as the weight varies. If you move it in the family to, <coughs> to a very positive and regular weight, then it would have to be a classical cusp form. To a classical cusp form here, one can lift it to GLN, and one has the Galois representations by the case, the polarizable case I discussed at the start, 
and then you can hope to do some sort of eladic continuation back to here and recover this representation and then split it into two pieces. So that's roughly speaking the, <coughs> the uh, approach, but one has to figure out how to construct such an overconvergent eladic cusp form. Okay, so I need to introduce some uh, notations. So G uh, will be the unitary group I just wrote down, the quasi-split unitary similitude group defined for uh, F to the 2N. And I, taking the definiteness, let me take the sort of uh, anti-diagonal form defined by the anti matrix with just ones along the anti-diagonal. I will uh, need to pay particular attention to one of the maximal parabolic subgroups, the maximal parabolic subgroup that in writing it in this way is just has an n to n, n by n block of zeros in the lower left. And I also want its Levy component, which I can just take to be uh, things with the zeros in the n by n block in the lower left and the top right. And this is isomorphic to nothing else. Oh, uh, let me, I want to make some, j just to make things simpler, I'm going to make some simplifying assumptions. Uh, I want to take, uh, let me take F imaginary quadratic Uh, let me take, so I can reduce then to Q by base change and then similar things work over any CM or totally real field, but the notation gets a bit worse. I'll assume L splits in F. I'll assume that pi is unramified at L. Uh, anything else I wanted to assume? Check. Oh, and pi infinity uh, has the infinitesimal character of the trivial representation. So they don't make any essential difference, but it's easier to discuss it. In this case, then, this is isomorphic to the restriction of scalars from F to Q of GLN cross GL1. So our pi can be thought of as a rep representation of this L. If I have uh, U, an open subgroup of A infinity, finite Adels, I can, as usual, attach to U uh, a Shimura variety, XU over spec Q in this case. Uh, in this case, it will have dimension N squared. And it will be the moduli space for triples A, uh, I, lambda, eta, where A, some base S, where A over S is an abelian scheme, uh, dimension 2n, I think. Uh, I maps F into the endomorphisms of A, tensored with Q such that the, uh, the Lie algebra of A, which will then have an action of O, S, and of F, is locally free over this tensor product. Uh, lambda is a polarization. Um, such that it... Uh, such that the corresponding Rosati involution is complex con conjugation on F, so I of A composed with lambda, I of A dual composed with lambda is lambda composed with I of the complex conjugate of A. And eta is a U-level structure, which I won't describe.
So we get a P out from more variety. XU is not, uh, in general, compact, projective. And <coughs> we have various compactifications. So XU, given certain additional data, some sort of cone decomposition, one gets a smooth so-called toroidal compactification. But it's not canonical. It depends on the additional data. We also have a canonical so-called minimal compactification, which will be uh, the minimal normal compactification, bailey borel compactification. And I will want a notation for the boundary. And uh, Kai Wen has shown that this all, Kai Wen Lan, that this all makes, in the special case, that U is some uh, group away from L cross G of ZL, and is a good prime. Uh, I think I was assuming, I assumed, yeah, I assumed L split in F. Then uh, this all makes sense not just over the rational numbers, but over Z localized at L. <coughs> I get integral models at L. Um, I will write uh, I will write bars over things to show the reduction model. So I'll get things like x bar u, x bar u minimal, x bar u sigma over fl. Uh, and I will be very interested in the ordinary locus. So the locus in here, it makes sense for the compactifications too. Uh, on the open Shimura variety, it's where the parameterize is an ordinary abelian variety, where A is ordinary. Uh, over these, you can define it somehow in various ways. I mean, the sort of the residual abelian variety could be ordinary, or you could define it also in terms of the Hasser invariant, which is a section of an ample line bundle on this thing, and it's the non vanishing locus for the Hasser invariant. And that also shows that x bar ordinary u minimal is a fine, because it's the locus of non-vanishing, as I say, for a section of an ample line bundle. I'm also going to want to consider the uh, eladic analog of the ordinary locus. So in xu, uh, well, I'll put star, it can either be nothing, the minimal compactification, or a toroidal compactification, which is initially an algebraic variety. I can turn it into a dagger space in the sense of grosser Klerner. This is, some, this is like a rigid space, except one systematically uses over-convergent sections or <coughs> over-convergent uh, functions. So it's a, it's a sort of, it's an eladic. <coughs> an eladic space associated to the to, to xu. And in there, I can consider those points, the so-called tube of x bar ordinary u in, with any of these compactifications or none at all, which are just the set, as I say, the set of points that reduce to the ordinary locus. And I'll denote that x ordinary u in any of these. There is. Uh, it comes with a natural lift of the Frobenius, coming by the fact that uh, over here there's a canonical subgroup defined, and Frobenius just mods out an abelian variety by its canonical subgroup. And the other thing uh, that will be very important to us is just as this thing is a fine, 
the ordinary locus in the minimal compactification over the L-adic numbers is affinoid. Uh, we can also define uh, if rho is a representation, an algebraic representation of L, we get a locally free sheaf, so called automorphic vector bundle, on X of U. So its sections will be, as it, as it were, holomorphic automorphic forms of some weight, if there are any such things. And it has a natural extension to the any toroidal compactification. And I will sometimes call the canonical extension. And also, whose sections, if you think of classical modular forms, its sections would be modular forms of a certain weight. There's also the subcanonical extension, which is just the canonical extension tensored with the structure sheaf of the boundary. And its sections would be cusp forms. Um, so, for instance, if you take uh, the representation L to uh, what do I want to say? L to the representation of L that sends a pair G in the restriction of scalars of GLN and a, uh, a scalar lambda onto lambda, I think it's maybe lambda inverse G tensor G complex conjugate, if I got it right, then, then E for this particular representation canonically extended is isomorphic to the uh, the one forms on X with log poles along the toroidal boundary. So differentials with log poles are an example of a canonical extension. And I said we were going to talk about uh, overconvergent alladic modular forms or automorphic forms, and these will just be sections of of one of these sheaves over uh, the ordinary locus. So uh, gamma x u sigma ordinary E rho sub will be the space of overconvergent uh, eladic cusp forms, I you might say of, of weight rho. Um, and this comes with a, you can take the trace down this Frobenius lift I mentioned and things which are sort of have non-zero eigenvalues of this are called finite slope. An important role, finite slope is a linear combination of generalized eigenvectors. of trace down f in analog of the up operator in the usual theory of modular forms. Uh, so linear combination of generalized even trace down f with non-zero eigenvalue. And as I say, these things fit into families as rho varies, the so-called theory of the uh, eigenvarieties or eigencurves, and uh, 
in that family, if you, as I say, if you specialize the family to any row that's sufficiently regular and also sufficiently high weight, you get a classical cusp form, not just a classical form, but a classical cusp form, which you can then lift to GLN, GL2N, and associate a Galois representation to it. Because it will be, you know, it will remain a cusp form on GL2N usually, and it will have, uh, <coughs> it, it will be polarized. And then you can continue those representations back and you <coughs> obtain the following lemma. So if pi is an irreducible admissible representation of G of the Adels away from infinity and L. Yes, I, I believe that if you're that you need to be both over-convergent and finite slope to be able to eladically continue. <coughs> so if pi is an irreducible miscible representation of on the space of over of finite slope, over-convergent uh, eladic cusp forms, then you can continue and specialize to real cusp forms, and then there exists R L pi from G F to G L 2 N Q L bar, associated to pi, as we said before, and ramified almost everywhere in the Frobenius eigenvalues coming from the Sataki isomorphism and pi V. So although I said uh, use the eigenvariety, I don't actually know that anybody's written down the construction of the eigenvariety in this setting, though it shouldn't be very difficult. What we actually did was go back to an older argument of Nick Katz uh, in the modular curve case, which is slightly easier to generalize. Uh, okay. So now what we need to do is to show that uh, need to show that the induction from L or P of A infinity L to G of A infinity L of the representation of GLN that we started with is occurs in such a space is oh, is uh, finite slope and over convergent. And then there's a little bit of argument left. You're getting a, a representation of twice the dimension you want. But by running this argument not only with pi, but of a whole series of twists by pi by certain characters, you get a whole series of two n-dimensional representations. And then it's rather easy algebra to show that they all split up. And half of them is the representation you want associated to pi. <coughs> OK, so the real question is, uh, <coughs> why? Oh, and yeah. I mean, you shouldn't be entirely surprised that you see something that looks like an Eisenstein series occurring in analytic cusp forms. If you take the usual Eisenstein series of level 1 and weight k on GL2q and look at This difference, which is another perfectly good Eisenstein series, this is in fact, an, not only is it a, a holomorphic Eisenstein series, but it is an eladic cusp form. If you think about it as a cusp form, as an eladic modular form, it becomes a cusp form because you're f it vanishes at the one cusp that's relevant for testing cuspidality in the eladic world. On the other hand, this is not going to be that quite that sort of thing. It, this is actually going to occur as uh, in a weight where there are no classical forms. So it's, it's like maybe occurring in negative weight or something in the uh, elliptic modular world. But nonetheless, <coughs> one can still continue it. 
Okay, so how how do we produce uh, such an elladic modular form? <coughs> well, I'm going to look at some sort of cohomology of the ordinary locus in characteristic P. And I'm going to write HI with compact supports towards the toroidal boundary, this little symbol means <coughs> of this. Well, this doesn't have a meaning, so let me give it a meaning. I'm going to take the hypercohomology on the toroidal compactification of the ordinary locus. So this isn't, this isn't uh, proper because the non-ordinary locus is mis missing, but it is proper as the abelian variety degenerates. With coefficients in the uh, in the complex of differentials with log poles, uh, log poles tensored with so this compact support towards the toroidal boundary means that I tensor here with the, uh, sorry, this is no longer in, this is <coughs> now in characteristic zero. Well, it doesn't matter. But it's the cohomology on, and I didn't want the bar here. So I take this dagger space of over, this sort of slightly over-converged ordinary locus, <coughs> and I take the sort of uh, hypercohomology there of the, Differentials with log poles tensored with the ideal sheaf of the boundary, which one might expect was defining some sort of cohomology of this sort. The notation suggests that this should be independent of sigma and indeed of the lifting I chose here. I presume that's true, though I haven't checked it. We're in good shape. We've got a sufficiently canonical lifting, this thing that we just worked with this throughout. <coughs> but morally, I think it, it should just depend on the special fiber and and not the toroidal compactification you chose. And now we're going to compute this object in two ways. So <coughs> the first way, whenever one has some sort of durham like cohomology, there's <coughs> a spectral sequence involving the cohomology of particular terms in this complex converging here. So we get something of the form HI x ordinary u sigma omega j x u sigma log poles along the toroidal boundary x u sigma are converging to h i plus j in this strange cohomology theory. And now the uh, key observation here is that most of these terms vanish. So h i x ordinary u sigma omega j x u sigma log tensor e whenever I take cohomology in degree i greater than 0. And the proof for the proof, there are two observations. To compute this, I'm first of all going to take the higher direct image of this sheaf down from the toroidal compactification to the minimal compactification via this map pi. So the first calculation is that our i pi lower star, well, not just of this, this is, a, this is an example of one of these subcanonical extensions. So e rho sub, any, for any weight rho, not just the weight that's giving rise to these particular differential forms equals zero for all i greater than zero. <coughs> so we proved this, but uh, later we were told that Heder was already aware of this fact, at least in a similar setting. He didn't know that. Uh, well, if anyone's interested, I can come back at the end. I, won't, I don't have time to say why this is true. It's crucial that we use the subcanonical extension. It's not true you use the canonical extension. 
And the second observation is that this thing is, is affinoid, is xu min. Once we've gone down to the minimal compactification, this thing is affinoid, so its higher cohomology vanishes. So the upshot is that this cohomology is computed by a complex that just involves the uh, oven convergent erratic uh, cusp forms of various weights. So if we show that the representation we want occurs in here, it will occur in one of these H zeros. So it's sufficient to prove this induction of pi occurs in uh, H i So th this is this is now a co this is some this is some sort of variant of rigid cohomology for these varieties that are some sort of variant of rigid cohomology in this setting. So rigid cohomology is a vague cohomology theory. One should compare this to a lattic cohomology or something very unlike this, which is a uh, risky cohomology of uh, locally free sheaves. <coughs> Now one can sort of be optimistic because if one takes the Avey cohomology theory of the whole of the variety in characteristic zero, not just the ordinary locus, then it's uh, known by various methods, for instance, calculations of Schwermer, that the Eisenstein classes we want do occur. So if I, if I, didn't, just, if I didn't have the ordinary locus here, this would be known uh, by some sort of analytic calculation. And the question is somehow to copy, find an algebraic version of that calculation and show that it continues to work when one has, uses just the ordinary locus, not the whole Shimura variety. OK, so I now need to calculate this <coughs> in a second way. And for that, I'm going to need the, to look a bit more closely at the boundary of the uh, toroidal compactification. So I'm going to write uh, partial lower j for the uh, disjoint union of the j-fold intersections of irreducible boundary components. So for instance, I mean, if we the blackboard was the Shimura variety and this was the boundary, then partial zero would be the compactified variety. It would just be the whole uh, blackboard. Partial one would be the disjoint union of these two boundary components. Partial two would just be the one point where they intersect. <coughs> and there's a, another spectral sequence that I now discover is standard that <coughs> computes this sort of cohomology with compact support in terms of the cohomology of the boundary starter. So there's a spectral sequence, partial x, u, sigma, ordinary, omega, So where now on each boundary stratum we take, uh, <coughs> we just take the sort of Durham cohomology. And this is, by definition, something that's well studied. It's the rigid cohomology of uh, delta j x bar u sigma board. <coughs> And I should mention that there's a natural Frobenius on here, and there's natural Frobenius is on the rigid cohomology, and these things match up. And when I introduced this cohomology theory, I said nothing very much about it, because the basic 
I mean, none of the basic things you'd hope to be true, I think, are obvious from the definition. But once you have this way of calculating it, the sim theorems have been proved about the rigid cohomology of these now, these are now open varieties because they're missing the non-ordinary locus. So for the rigid cohomology of open varieties, we know, <coughs> we know quite a lot about these things. So Bertolo and Chiarolotto prove that this is finite dimensional. Uh, prove that it's mixed with weights greater than or equal to i. So that means there's a filtration. The graded pieces are pure, and the weights of those pure parts are all greater than or equal to i if I'm in degree i. And you can calculate h0 is what you think it is. Uh, it's just uh, ql to the group of components. I think those are the things that I need to know. And once we know that here, <coughs> uh, we see that this is also now we know finite dimensional and mixed with weights greater than or equal to i. And the second place where we get lucky is that it's not going to be necessary to look at the whole of this cohomology. I'm just going to take the lowest weight part of it. I'm going to look at the weight zero part of this thing. Well, that will come from the weight zero parts over here. But in HI, all the weights are greater than or equal to I by the bertillo chiarolotto theorem. And so <coughs> the only things that will contribute to the weight zero part are the H zeros. And we know how to compute the H zeros in terms of the combinatorics of the boundary component. So this will just be the cohomology of the complex QL to the components of x bar or du sigma to ql to the group of components or the set of components of first boundary components, irreducible components of the boundary, and then ql to the sort of intersection of two irreducible components of the boundary, and so on. <coughs> And it's uh, convenient to sort of uh, uh, encode this information in a simplicial complex. So I'll write SU sigma ord to be the simplicial complex uh, whose uh, vertices correspond to irreducible boundary components. this toroidal compactification, and faces where well, you put a face amongst the set of vertices if and only if the corresponding uh, boundary components have non-empty non intersection. <coughs> and then we see that this weight zero part is nothing else than the cohomology of this uh, simplicial complex, at least if I stay away, I mean, this first term isn't included in the simplicial complex. So this is for i greater than 1, which isn't a very serious <coughs> restriction. So all in all, we wanted to see that this induction of pi, parabolic induction of pi, occurred in overconvergent modular forms. We saw that it, sufficient to see it occurred in some sort of rigid cohomology, and then in fact, in the weight zero part, that has a purely combinatorial description in terms of the cohomology of this simplicial complex. So it's enough to see that this contains the induction of pi. Well, <clears throat> 
the first thing are the vertices of this simplicial complex, or say the same thing, the irreducible components of the boundary of the toroid of compactification, are each associated to a maximal parabolic subgroup. And we want to, first of all, focus our attention on the particular maximal parabolic sub subgroup P. <coughs> so one can define a sub simplicial complex uh, ord primed u sigma, which are the corresponding to the vertices uh, not associated to P or the other ones. This being a subcomplex will be closed. And uh, if I have a topological space, I can def I will define its interior cohomology to be the image of its cohomology with compact support in its cohomology. And this has the property that when I have a compact set contain when an open subset, then the interior cohomology of the open subset is a subquotient of the cohomology of A. So I'm going to apply that to the the my all my the simplicial complex associated with all the boundary components minus the simplicial complex applied to the uh, just those components not associated to P, and I see that it's sufficient to see that induction of pi infinity L uh, occurs in the cohomology of the total space of the whole complex, mine the open subset in here corresponding to uh, just those uh, which are associated to P. Because this will be a subquotient of that cohomology up there, uh, interior cohomology. OK, and now <coughs> we're going to look at this. Uh, how, do, how do we understand what this is? How do we understand the components, what the components on the boundary look like? Well, they are described by the toroidal data, the, the, the cone decomposition sigma that you needed to specify the toroidal compactification. This case, there are sort of disjoint union of the thing I'm about to describe. You take Hermitian matrix over F completed at infinity, n by n Hermitian matrices. <coughs> this is just C. And you take uh, those that are positive definite. So that defines some sort of cone in some space. And what you're asked, the data sigma. Oh, so I should say that this has an action of L Q just by a congruence or whatever. G maps A to G A transpose G bar. And so we have to decompose this cone into a series of polygonal cones which will somehow sort of come closer and closer together as you, the infinitely many are getting closer and closer together as you go towards this boundary. And this has to have the property that it's invariant under the action, well, maybe not of the whole of this, but of some discrete subgroup in here. <coughs> so that's the sort of data that goes into sigma. There the are going to be a whole series of copies of this, so you're going to get this data several times over, but something like this. And then the irreducible components correspond to the one cones. And irreducible components intersect when those one cones all live in the same cone of some higher dimension. So put another way, if I put a sort of transversal in here, so instead of looking at this, I look at um, F infinity N positive definite modulo R cross greater than zero, 
then the <coughs> irreducible components will be the points here. And uh, they will intersect. I mean, they, they, will span a, they will span a simplex exactly when they're supposed to pan, span a simplex in here. Yes, and it won't really matter which you sigma you chose. Uh, <coughs> and in fact, but in fact, I should remember that there's an action of some discrete subgroup of LFQ on here, and two cones give the same boundary component if they're related by gamma. So I really, what I find is that <coughs> this, the, this simplicial complex, this minus this, is a triangle triangulation of this space. Or as I say, I may have many copies of this, but anyway, this is <coughs> uh, sort of many copies of the cohomology of a space like this. But this is exactly, this thing is just L of R modulo U infinity, a maximal connected compact mod center subgroup of L of R. This is a locally symmetric space associated to L. And this thing, when you keep track of all the copies and so on, is nothing but the induction from P A infinity L to G A infinity L of the cohomology of a locally symmetric space or a, lim a limit of these things for L. And I want the interior cohomology of this thing, but this exactly <coughs> does see, it's known that this thing sees pi infinity L, cus forms that are cohomological contribute to the cohomology of the corresponding locally symmetric space. If it's a cus form, it really contributes to the interior cohomology. And hence, <coughs> the induction, as I say, contributes here and does in the boundary. So somehow, the, the way the boundary components in the toroidal compactification are fitting together is combinatorially exactly the same as a some triangulation of the locally symmetric space <coughs> associated to GLN over the uh, imaginary quadratic field. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs>